welcome to Lee G. He's still in the UK, but actually for less than a week now. Time is creeping up on him. And um, he's not a happy bunny. Um, things are not the same as they used to be. Well, that's a sign of old age normally, but I've got to agree with him. And um, things are not in many countries, but certainly in dear old UK, standards ain't what they used to be. Go on, have a good rant, mate. Yeah, Britain's no country for old men, I tell you. Or for young men, or young women, or old women, or children, or dogs, or cats. Everybody abandoned Britain. And then as you leave, the last person out, switch the lights off. What a load of rubbish Britain has become. It's absolutely terrible. This is this is my weekend, right? This is a, just this is a snapshot of one man's weekend in Britain. I got barred from a pub. That's not I'm so I'm a Mancunian, but it's not happened to me for decades. I got barred from a pub. This is why I got barred from the pub. Uh, because I went into this pub, I only go into it, it's called the Spread Eagle at Gailey Island. Remember, Spread Eagle, Gailey Island, uh, in near Wolverhampton. And, um, yeah, and I go in there because they serve the world's greatest pint of pedigree. I've never ever tasted pedigree so good. So I've made a pilgrimage there every night. Anyway, this, uh, this particular night, um, we went in. And they've got a little table there with a little man standing behind it. He's like going in jail or in court. And he says, uh, uh, can, I, can you go and sit at table 30, please? And I said, I don't want a table. I've come in for a drink, mate. And he says, well, it's all right. You still have to go and wait at uh, uh, table 30. And uh, we'll send a waitress to help serve you. <sighs> Fair I enough. Know, Lee, are these COVID regulations, are they still in force? I thought everything was down. No, no, it's nothing to do with it. It's spread eagle re regulations. This is spread eagle regulations and revelations. And um, yeah, no, nothing to do with COVID. It was because he thought he was going to be busy. So he'd allocated three tables for drinkers. I'm a drinker, I'm also an eater, otherwise I'd just die, right? So I was allocated a drinker's table, right? In the drinker's department of three tables and two of the drinker's tables were taken up by people eating. So I'm standing there like an idiot. Like, you know, you just don't really do it. I don't know why I did it. I think it's because I'm over 40 now. And so I just stood there like that way, looking like, best one cutie and dead look like. Watching people go like that. 27 people went to the bar and ordered a drink before I went over and said, uh, excuse me, mate, what do you think you're doing? You made me stand there at that table over there and uh, I'm telling me that I'm going to get a waitress. I don't really want a waitress. All I want is a pint. And yet I've watched 27 people get served while I've been waiting. And he had he said these glorious words. Oh, I'm sorry you've not enjoyed your experience, sir. I looked at it. So what experience? I'm an experiencing an idiot. A bloke who's good, de dedicated 80 tables to people who eat and three tables to people who drink. Like that. Anyway, he told me never to come back again. <laughs> oh, there's a hint there. There's a hint there. And it's called the cliché. Are you enjoying your experience? <laughs> exactly. Now, that's... You know, that's how woke is. That's the definition of woke. It's all Absolutely. vacuous, empty words. Meaning, exactly. And they're all clones, Lee. Mm. Clowns. Clowns. As well. Clowns. Clowns. So yeah. Listen, I, I've got to pick you up on, on something because we're going to discuss for a little while anyway. Diet. And how bad is our diet? Because a new report's come out and it said... Actually, with all the figures that are now coming in, both sides of the dreaded pond, it is now more dangerous to eat badly than to smoke badly. Now, that is something that we've got to take care of. So yeah. what do I mean? Well, you're the prime example. 
you've just come in through the door behind your left shoulder and said to me, I've just had a, a couple of Big Macs, a couple of big fries and a couple of big drinks. And then what did you say? What else did you have? Four Mars bars. Oh, <laughs> my goodness me. It wasn't a fried Mars bar, was it? No, they don't do them anymore in, in Newport, in Shropshire. Oh. <laughs> they oh. kept burning the chip shop down. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, when it was breakfast, I was having breakfast. I don't care what no. you're having, it's bad for you. Listen, we are told now, <laughs> well, we've always been told, really, haven't we, uh, to be plenty of fruit, plenty of greens. But now it's those two, of course, but plenty of grains. Grains are good for you. And grain. oil made, made out of grains are good for you, apart from olive oil, which is the best oil, of course. A bit expensive in the UK, but not generally in Europe. That is very good for you. Uh, but uh, you're not on the right diet. Now, don't tell me you had salad on the burgers. No, but I have a lot of fruit because I, I, uh, wine's made of grapes. So I have lots of grapes. And um, it's, uh, yeah. No, it's, I do. I, I did. I don't now. But I used to eat very healthy, I think. But I came back to Britain on an odyssey of not eating well, of eating meat, potato pies, kebabs fish and chips and drinking copious amounts of English beer. And that's what I've been doing. And I must admit, I, feel, I do feel a bit sluggish and a bit tired. I'm not getting the exercise I used to get uh, because there's nowhere to go. It's just boring and you have to drive everywhere. So, yeah, uh, my diet at this moment is unhealthy. But really, is it are two Big Macs, two large fries, two giant Coca-Colas and four Mars bars for breakfast. Is that unhealthy? Oh, well, I rest my case. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> draw your own conclusions about the man. But before we say and condemn uh, the UK, let's have a go at Spain, because Spain has gone yeah. so left-wing, it's almost communist. And yeah. things are passing here that you would never get... Uh, in many European countries. The oh, control I... is awful. Now, I have been informed through a banking source, hush, hush, that you cannot now pay more than about £800 into a bank account or take it from a bank account without it being reported. In other words, they're really cutting down on those cash deals that have been uh, at the right. mark of Spain for years. It's called black money. Uh, people yeah. had a bit for you, a bit for the government, and a bit for uh, who, whoever else. Uh, mm. but black money thrives. They're trying to get rid of it. But £900, you have to report everything. Uh, that is interesting. So be careful when you get over here, which will be very shortly. Uh, mm. Don't draw out more than £900 because you might find it difficult and having to fill in so many forms. Um, things are closing in, but are they closing in too fast? Are they not getting the real people, the real bank robbers, those that sit behind big business chairs, the fat cats? They're the ones that sh they should be getting at. Yeah, um, funnily enough, um, I went to the bank today in Britain, and uh, that was the HSBC um, in the market town of Newport in Shropshire. And um, I wanted to take out a thousand pounds just so that was, you know, just for uh, bits of money on the journey. We got, you know, money to spend instead of having to pay everything by, by card. And may I reiterate the conversation I had with the, uh, with the lady teller behind the counter. I went up to the car and said, how do you do? She said, oh, hello, Mr. Banks. I've not seen you for a while. I said, no, I've been away for four years. I've been living in Slovakia. She said, oh, I thought you might have been ill. I thought, oh, thank you very much. So anyway, she said, so everything's good for you. We had this conversation like that. And I said, can I have a thousand pounds out of the bank? And she said, uh, oh, of course you can, Mr. Banks. And um, she said, if I type in here, you could go and get it out of the uh, wall, the, the hole in the wall machine. And I, 
I don't want to get it out of the hole in the wall machine. Thank you. I'm standing here. Uh, the bank talking to you and I don't want it in fifties and hundreds and all kinds of amounts that you can't spend. So she said, oh, well, you'll have to fill a form in. I thought, why? If I went and stood on the street, I don't have to fill a form in. But I'm standing in front of you, I've got to fill a form. So anyway, I filled the form in. She said then, have you got any proof of identity? I said, well, yeah, you've got my card. She said, no, I need some alternative proof of identity. I said, what's my name? She said, oh, Mr Banks. I said, yes, so you know who I am. She said, yes, of course I do, Mr Banks. I said, well, just give me money. And she said, I'm sorry, I can't without any proof of identity. Like that, what a ludicrous place, Brim is. Well, it is, but don't forget... We're used to this, Lee. So are you, if you're honest, mate. We've had this in Europe for years, but now it's spread to Britain. Why yeah. GDPR, the European Union? Now, mm. let's have some courage. Now we're out. Boris has done his little bit. Let's get rid of these laws. Do you think they'll ever get rid of them? No, because there's so many people employed, making it difficult to trade, making it difficult mm. to do anything. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I sympathise with you. I had a very similar experience two months ago in Spain with a Spanish bank. I wanted €3,000 out. Uh, oh, we've not got it. I said, hang on, you're not a corner street bank. You're a massive bank and you're a big branch. Uh, surely you've got €3,000. There's a safe behind you. Go in there and get it. Oh, we can't <laughs> do it. And, you know... She had to open the back of the ATM machine, which backed into the bank. And out and out came trays and trays of money just to get me my money. The whole world has gone mad. It's become automated. We're just a number. Nothing else, Lee. No. I know. I know. What's that famous saying? That famous saying, I am a man. I am not a number. What was that? Bloke. Oh, I can see that works for you as well. You remember it. The bloke, the, the thing that was done at that, that prisoner. Yes. Nobody Patrick McGowan. No, nobody understood that, but it was... Yeah, I did. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed? I've got my test card on. Oh, my God. Well, I've never interviewed and spoken to or joined... What's it with with a guy that looks like a licorice of all sorts? There is a, <laughs> another story to that, which we'll come on to later. And we uh, never we do, yeah, let me mention LinkedIn because they've joined the club of the really big boys. They've gone yeah. completely over the top. Link, LinkedIn. There's a certain gentleman uh, called uh, Greg Wrightstone, and Greg is an evident geologist, and he's written lots of books and. Uh, He's got his own opinions of how uh, we are with climate change, what stage we're at, etc. It's a free world. No, it's not, because LinkedIn didn't agree with him. You've got to accept that climate change exists and we're all going to die. Well, he says, no, there's another side to the story. He's been removed from LinkedIn. Now, really? LinkedIn is, yeah, LinkedIn is mainly for business people. Well, ostensibly yeah. so. But yeah. when you've got Big Brother, and this is Big Brother, whether it be YouTube, Twitter, whoever, and they're calling the tune and naming the game and stymieing free speech, someone's got to change, Lee. I'm surprised at LinkedIn, really. Um, it seems to be one of the, one of the most staid and uh, traditional... Uh, it's traditional is not really the right word, but it's the most staid and sort of uh, conservative in the small C site that seems to, like you say, be respect business people. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that bloke has every right to say what he says. And um, LinkedIn shouldn't be uh, pulling him down for saying it. Um, there's just no reason. Well, yeah, the, re but, the reason but, is can council culture. I mean, it's through every part of society now. If you yeah, don't agree with this, if you come out of university, head full of nonsense, which I'm afraid at least half the students mm. do, you've been brainwashed, 
and you think you know everything and this is coming out of that it's a, it is a strange thing you know this is this is a major debate whether um you i know i know your views on it you know mine i i believe there is um a change a dramatic change in the weather and i do believe that uh, humanities contributed to it quite a lot i think the meteor that hit the earth or glanced off the earth um, few, many years ago uh, also created no no you see look at him he thinks he thinks i'm mad uh, but if you notice ever since we had that problem the sun has got so low that you can't drive at certain parts and times of the days and that didn't happen before that so there are things that are happening in this world that are changing and it is possible to try and uh, alter them and make some kind of contribution but that doesn't mean charging me and Rodney more for us to drive our diesel cars or make us get little smart cars like that it's be do something realistic and for that bloke to be taken down off LinkedIn for expressing his own personal views unless there was something abjectly politically wrong in it I've not read the article or what he said I really don't know enough to pass judgment on its contents and its idiosyncrasies, idiosyncrasies and everything but in principle no I, I i well they've got a right to do it. it's their site they can do what they want with it i decide what i put on my site you decide what you put on your radio uh, sorry on your television station they've got as much right as you and i have to make that decision but it's Let's go for the truth. It's always good to go for the truth. And by the way, um, it illustrates a point, maybe. If you're seeing bright lights when the sun goes down, the sun's getting stronger. Time for an optician, mate. And uh, that is the first sign, often, not everything, for cataracts. But well, that no. comes with old age. But this is different. This is different. This is the old man of the sun who's actually now at a different level and everybody there are websites about it there are there are facebook sites about it and there is a difference now at certain times how the sun hits uh, hits uh, your sight of vision and um uh, you know even andrea complains about it and everybody i know complains about it see maybe it's a, maybe it's an english thing but i did no we did experience it in Slovakia as well. You don't but he's, get the sun yeah, going down in England, it's always down. Yeah, but he didn't do do it the way it does it now. It does it differently. <laughs> well, I was going to say it's the Marstons. It's not the Marstons. It's the McDonald's <laughs> that have caused this. And we, we move on. And listen, a lot of scandal about E10, this fuel mm. additive, ethanol in your petrol. Mm. Is it a plot? Is it a plot to cover up the price of petrol? Is it a plot to damage your engines, which certain people are saying if you've got an older car, mm. that you'll have to go electric? Sounds a bit conspiracy to me, that one. To be honest, uh, I am the least conspiritual person I know. Uh, I have no faith in conspiracy theories. I have no respect for them. But even I'm starting to believe that there could be something going on, man. Honestly, just think about it. Like, all the tanker drivers disappeared overnight in Britain. You know, oh, oh well, they all retired, was the answer. Oh, where well, the tanker drivers? Oh, well, they all retired. Or they all got fed up and went to work at McDonald's. Or um, do it all. A place. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. This is an industry that's been working for over a century. Wagon drivers, and they have uh, something that copes with natural wastage. So, if somebody retires, somebody else moves into the job and takes over. And so, yes, no, they all retired, so we've got no wagon drivers. So, we've asked the Polish to come across and do white driving our wagons, uh, and they won't come. Why would what makes you surprised they won't come? Because I'll have to go up the jobs they've got over there that are full time jobs to come over here and work for a few weeks. What a load of rubbish. But then you start to look at, yeah, let's, uh, the reason we got all this trouble is because the, the, uh, the petrol 
producers or people who send it out across Britain have locked up all the diesel and all the four star and all the stuff like that. So why then you've got no tanker drivers and all the diesels locked up? But it all happens at the same time as this ethanol petrol is being sent out across the country. Now, if you think, where did they get the tanker drivers to do that? If it was all sent out, right, across the country, and it was all you could get to put in your car, right, or your big truck or whatever, well, did they get it there? All the tanker drivers had retired. Did they all come back and do little parts? Oh, I'll only drive ethanol like that. Yeah, why? Why? It's all very very strange indeed and yet it's apparently ruining engines which again adds to your conspiracy theory it's exactly what you said it's killing off all the old car engines so we all end up with a little smart car oh that's it the milk float the dynamic milk float uh, yeah but, uh, as normally things are a bit more complicated than we first mentioned because Allegedly today, it's been proven that there are 50,000 HGV qualified lorry drivers in the United Kingdom that don't want to come back to work. Why? Well, one of the reasons they said is that there's too many Polish lorry drivers and from other nations coming in half the rate that they should be paid. They've got it away from for years. Now, of course, with lockdowns, etc., the government have been far too generous why bother going back to work? Put that in the pot together with the DVLA, which is quite shameful. They've mm. left the DVLA in Wales. Probably Uncle Mark has designed a way of uh, keeping them on strike. You can't deal with the DVLA. There would have been at least 3,000 more lorry drivers if they'd have done the work that they should have been doing all the way along. A lot of things wrong and perfect storm, as we say. Um, yeah. And it, when it all comes together like that, that's why there's going to be difficulties for quite a long time. Everybody yeah. looks forward to Christmas, but this year there might be a bit of a damper on it. But do your own thing. Dare yeah. I say, let's have a traditional Christmas. No. Well, it's a traditional Christmas. Getting drunk and falling asleep in front of the telly. Well, I mean, you do that anyway, don't you, Lee? I don't. No, I don't have a Christmas. I don't have a Christmas. I don't believe in Christmas. I believe Christmas is the biggest waste of money this country has ever come across. It's nothing to do with Christianity. It's nothing to do with, with religion. It's nothing to do with caring for your family. It's nothing to do with anything. You buy people loads of plastic things that you don't want to spend your money on and they don't want to own. Then you go and sit down and around a table where the penance is you eat turkey, which you never eating the rest of the year and sprouts that you never eaten the rest of the year so you eat food you don't want to eat you drink rubbish cider and bottled beer that you really wouldn't touch forever then you watch telly that's a load of rubbish that you don't want to watch and you've never wanted to watch and then you have a row he's right i can't argue with him so there we are <laughs> if that's traditional christmas we don't want it get back to the original christmas before we do that, do you believe in Santa Claus still? Uh, I didn't, no, no. Uh, Santander put me off that when they ripped me off on things like that. When they got their claws into me, yeah. Yeah, bad bank, bad bank. <laughs> yeah. yeah, bad bank, so that's what I call him. Uh, well, listen, uh, we've been accused of, of um, going against the NHS and GPs, but let me come to the defence of... Probably half the GPs, because actually they're still obeying the old fashioned rules. They are seeing people, generally so, they're seeing people in the morning. Uh, in the afternoon, they do things over Zoom or Skype or whatever you do. So they're still seeing people, but it's a mess. Mm. Um, I've read a long article for a young person seven years in training come out of hospital after doing mm. two years in a and e 
uh, oh, I fancy becoming a GP. Mm. And uh, he was taken on by a practice and it was like a diary he'd written. And it's fascinating. Mm. He was required to work from eight o'clock in the morning till about two in the afternoon and grab an hour for lunch and a couple of coffee breaks. Uh, forget the uh, coffee breaks uh, and sometimes forget the hour for lunch because that's when you did your writing up mm. uh, work. But he's given 10 minutes or in his case, actually quarter of an hour because he was a learner GP. So they give them longer to spend a longer time to get going because an experienced GP will know how to do things. Uh, and he's only allowed 10 minutes. Lee, 10 minutes, NHS 10 minutes is just not sufficient. He recounted yeah. one story of an old lady in her late 70s uh, with very bad knees and very bad ankles. By the time she'd struggled into his room, I mean, seven minutes uh, had gone already. By the time he said, uh, and he nearly said, uh, well, can you manage to go and lie on the bed? And then he thought twice, no, just sit down. And by the time she'd opened her mouth, the time had gone. Mm. And because still young, out of uni, as it were, he felt guilty, did his best, and found out that the real reason she was there was not why he thought she'd come, but the fact that her husband had died very recently. And she wanted some comfort, some ideas to get over the stress and the depression and everything that company, uh, accompanies that situation. And all he could do was apologize and say, well, the earliest appointment I can see you again is in two weeks time. He felt rotten about that for the rest of the day. She felt rotten about it. But that's when you get a prescriptive service. Thou shalt have 10 minutes, in this case, quarter of an hour, and that's it. Um, he recounts other stories equally um, discomforting throughout the day. Um, and actually, uh, having done a couple of months of this, he was so depressed, he said... I'm going back to hospital. I can't be a GP. It doesn't mm. work. Of course it doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, It's uh, there, there was a report came out today and it was saying that, uh, and I, I can't remember the exact figures, uh, but most GPs now are doing the equivalent of three days' work uh, for their, yeah, 100 and whatever it is, £1,000 a year. Uh, and that's because the rest of the time is taken up by locums or by um, Zoom calls. Uh, I've I've got a very minor problem, uh, nothing of any great imports, but because Basically, before I know about this problem, it's major. No, go on. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's of no cost, but it's a bit. It hurts a bit. So. <laughs> um, and I don't want to drive for whatever thousand miles it is with this problem. That's probably given everybody a really big clue to what it is, but I didn't mean to. And it's not that anyway. But it might, I don't, anyway. So, um, uh, yeah, so I phoned, I didn't, I got the glorious Andrea to phone because uh, she has to do all my medical things for me because uh, I don't want the doctor to think I'm ill. And um, so she had to phone up and uh, uh, make an appointment and so I didn't get an appointment to go and see the doctor uh, I got a zoom call which is happening at half past three this afternoon which I've told them I'm going to ignore because I can't do it because we're doing talking and uh, I'm going to do it tomorrow but let me add on to that the, the fact that this doctor said yeah it's only a minor problem it doesn't matter uh, uh, but it's uncomfortable. So the doctor can do it. How's he going to do it over Zoom? What else does he find out? Oh, well, you think that's what it is because you've been on the internet. What if it's something else? Uh, let, let's have a look on Zoom. Yeah, right. Uh, what if it gets filmed? And uh, so, yeah, not doing that. So you don't get it. But this is a truthful thing. And 100% honest thing and it indicates something that I don't want to indicate and I've avoided but for the realms of this I will I am of a certain age 
I think it's when you're over 60, where you get invited in by your doctor to go to the Wellman's Clinic. And that's to check out certain parts of your uh, body uh, to make sure they're still working or you've still got one. And um, I, uh, I had my blood pressure done. No, that's not your blood pressure. Yeah, that's your blood pressure. I had that done. So, oh, your blood pressure's a bit high, Mr. Banks. I said, because I'm sitting in a doctor's surgery and you're prodding me with everything. And um, anyway, so it was a bit high, but she said, it's all right, it's gone down now. So I don't have high blood pressure. This is where the truth, she said, listen to me, heart. No, that's not your heart, is it? That's your heart. She said, uh, your heart's perfect. You have a perfect heart. I said, thank you very much. Like that. Then she said, Five years ago, or four years ago, or whatever it was, your cholesterol was uh, one click high. Um, I said, oh, all right then. So, are we going to check? He said, I'm sorry, we can't. And then she said, your PCR thing, or P PRCA, or something, something to do with your downstairs apparatus, right? She said, uh, was perfect uh, so many years ago. I said, she went, we checked out. She said, sorry, we can't. She said your diabetes uh, reckoning uh, a couple of years ago was um, uh, one click the same as the other high. I said, oh, should we check it out? She said, I'm sorry, we can't. Uh, and the last one was your liver. She said your liver count was quite high because you do drink. It does say on your records here that you do drink, Mr. Banks. And I thought, who doesn't, dear? She said, I don't. I don't drink. So anyway, it was up a bit. So I said, we better check that out, my dog. And she said, I can't. I said, oh, what's this well man test about then? You've told me my heart's all right and I've got a bit of high blood pressure. She said, what's the problem? Why can't you check me out? And she said, uh, uh, we've discussed this before, but it gets a bit bigger than this. She said, oh, well, we can't get hold of the blood bottles. Uh, I said, oh, well, that's all right then. That explains it. I said, I'll be back in six months. Will you have some then? She said, oh, probably, yes, we'll be able to do it then. So I'm in the pub with uh, some blokes that I know. One of them's 67. And I just said, do you know what? I said, I'm not as old as you, but I went for one of these tests. And he says, well, the well man says, he said, yeah. He says, I went last week. I said, did you get it done? He says, no, they haven't got any bottles. I'm walking down the street through Newport, seeing a bloke who's a really good friend, a bit older than me, and I've not seen him for years. And um, I said, how are you doing, mate? He says, oh, well, I've had a bit of a problem with me downstairs apparatus. Uh, I said, what? What do you mean? He says, ah, you know. And I said, oh. I said, yeah, so what are you doing? He says, well, I went for them and what, another test. They haven't got any bottles. So what's happening? Forget about the uh, engine oil. Forget about the e, uh, the uh, the petrol, the e, uh, petrol thing, and all these other things. Are they trying to get rid of old blokes now as well? Why can't you get a little bottle to put some blood in that you go like that? Yeah, you're dying. No, you're not. Yeah, you'll be all right. What is wrong? What is wrong with the NHS? And all these doctors are doing three days a week. And I found out at the end of my pretend well man test, where my heart was fine, I got like that, and they couldn't do anything else, that the person who was doing my doctoring, I said, so you're my doctor from now on? She said, oh no, I'm not a doctor. Well, why are you then? She said, I'm a paramedic. I got done by a paramedic. Yeah, you're lucky you to get me certain, usually a nurse practitioner, or I'm an ordinary nurse. Uh, you are well taken care of. This is the NHS. As a comparison, this very morning, uh, we got a hint and a nudge, uh, as we mentioned last week, that it's important to get your injection. Never mind the COVID one, which is important, the booster uh, yeah. in so many countries. But mm. get yourself jabbed against the flu, because that is at least the same as almost as big an issue as the COVID. It can yeah. be very dangerous when we've had a flat flu year, which we did, yeah. of course, last year. So I just phoned up my GP. He says, um, and it was 10 o'clock in the morning. He says, can you be here for 20 past 11? I said, yeah. OK. Now we had to pay for it, Lee. We had to pay I, the equivalent of about £30, a bit less. Mm. Uh, and you think, oh, well, you paid for it. Well, hang on. 
So of you, as you have mentioned in the UK so many times, you've paid into your stamp for donkey's years and your yeah. employer has uh, paid the other half or whatever. You have a right to go in there and be treated, but you've got no rights now. Big Brother has seen to that. The only people that have got rights are those that make the rights, and it ain't you and I. We've got to move on, Lee, for just some yeah. good, good news. The good news is, well, the bad news first, in that we can't drive electrical cars for long and we can't manufacture caravans and anything, washing machines, because there's no chips anywhere. Uh, there won't be I of the other side either the price of gas as it happens but we won't stray to that at the moment um but these uh, of course computer strips uh, they rely on lithium and yeah. um even china is now struggling but mm. i tell you who's not struggling hey here's the good news cornwall it is oh, yeah it mm. is hinted and it's almost certain to happen that the rock structure in cornwall is not just for tin as it has been for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, but you can get lithium uh, and you can get it directly out of very hard rock. It's not easy and it's costly, but by gum, if you get some of this very shiny metal, uh, it's worth a fortune. And apparently uh, there are a certain amount of wells and underground fissures uh, in Cornwall that have big lakes in them. And from this <laughs> lake, you can get lithium. Mm. So I hope it goes well for them. Uh, I hope they don't destroy the countryside as they have done when they got the clay thing going because there's mm. big scars on the land down there in Cornwall. And you mm. could do with that when your tourism is your really biggest in industry. But will it go down the same way as the fracking? Because the daft greens, and there are daft greens apart from sensible ones, more and more daft greens. Are they going to stop the fracking now? Are we going to be content? The fact that we've only got two power stations in Britain when we desperately are going to need more and the world is laughing at us, especially the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Get the fracking going because there's more gas there, etc. That will keep us going apparently for over 30 years. Get it going. Mm. We need it now before we fall into Mr. Putin's hands. Let's get some sensible green stuff now. Yeah, but is 30 years worth the trouble? That, you know, they, is it really worth the effort to, um, to do that? For, I think it is 30 years, isn't it? You know, what, what, what's the value to that? Why don't we find another form of power? Now, yeah, everywhere you go in Britain, in this wonderful place uh, called Britain, it's been turned into a greenhouse. Everywhere's got solar panels and the countryside's covered in solar panels. And what were those things called? Windmills you had as a child that used to use so old in the wind. Go, and they make a noise. They were really good. And you buy them on a the fairground, they're all multicoloured. Now we've got big white ones everywhere, all over the place, in the sea and everything. In, in the rivers, we've got those big things that rock backwards and forwards all to generate electricity and generate power and um, none of it's working isn't it time that we actually found out a way of doing it fracking is a very good idea but after a few years it's going to be of no value at all so we're going to pump millions into it and then it's going to come to an end and then we stuff we're left with these spinny things and uh, the big greenhouses it's a, it's a very awkward situation for uh, for our country that that we need power but really gas look at what's happened to the price of gas in britain what's happened now bills going up from a couple of hundred pounds a year to thousand pounds a year 400 pounds a year depending on which bit of thing you read how can people afford to do it do you know what I don't believe that the uh, winter fuel payment has gone up by by a hundred percent. Still stuck at two hundred quid, which it's been for the last 
whatever 15 years now Britain's on its knees everybody get out of there and last one switch the light off well I'll give you some stats now three times coal has gone up um, in the last few months price five times gas even uh, the top dogs were saying for goodness sake uh, use gas it's clean uh, especially yeah. natural gas doesn't pollute anything Suddenly it pollutes. We've gone too far with the green movement. Let me give you an example. Mm. Now, would you believe, trust people who stick themselves to motorways with super glue? <laughs> is that the right kind of person that should be preaching to you <laughs> and I saying, this is the way to do things? Mm. I don't think so. But no, they are doing it still. They've gone extinction rebellion, rebellion mm. of all their other mates. They're all in the yeah. same caboodle. Um, look at the facts, Lee. The facts are we need power. We need mm. it now. We don't want people dying of COVID and we don't want people dying of cold because that's going to happen. Because when we get a big high pressure area over, uh, as Canada found out uh, last year, when it had the monster heating campaign, uh, mm. we've got the cold campaign coming over and it freezes. The windmills are a fat lot of use then, they don't work. And we've got to have something that does work. Now, in the fullness of time, and we've mentioned this before, the great invention, we are inventors in the UK, is these mini um, magic uh, and very workable and cheap, relatively, um, atom stations mm. Uh, mm. you get a little atom bomb and control it and um, this is basic science i'm talking about. Mm. and mm. it produces via steam electricity so um i know some of the big plants especially in russia have had a horrible time it, it's got out of hand it's blown up you can't walk anywhere near it for thousands of years but apparently this new technology uh, is good for nuclear power. So mm. let's get that developed. It's nearly there. Uh, Mr. Mm. Rolls and Mr. Royce have, have, have come up with the idea and they've come up with some good ideas in the past. So there is hope. While I'm mentioning cars, something's come up this week that's very interesting because it, whether you're not a, a, a car buff or not, when manufacturers make cars, they make some very posh cars and they make some ordinary cars. Now, you pay more for your posh cars. Let's go to America. And you've got dealers offering spare parts. And if you buy um, a Corvette, which is a rather posh uh, Chevy, um, you're going to be charged. And you can get a new air conditioning unit, new seals for your doors, etc. But if you go in there, and get the right numbers, and you've got a friendly man behind the counter, you can say, I've got a Chevy. Uh, can I have that part? And he'll sell it you for half the price of the Corvette. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's been going on for years, and it's been going on in the United Kingdom for years. It's a ripoff. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, when we had some pasta, that's the um, Spanish way of saying dosh, um, then we did, I've got to say, I'm ashamed. No, I'm not. I was ashamed of this particular one. We happen to buy uh, a Rolls Royce, uh, oh, no. very second hand, uh, but a beautiful beast. It was Freddie Lakers. Remember that oh, now? No. The airline man's at Rolls Royce. It was an absolute disaster. Now, um, you need to be a brain surgeon to work on it. There's, there's wires everywhere, everywhere, and in and outside the engine. Uh, the first time, and it's the first time I ever made the papers, it was the old and cron. Uh, oh, really? You remember that, of course you do. Now, yeah. Manchester. And man gets trapped in car by <laughs> News Rolls Royce. And I did. Uh, I got in the back seat. I don't know why I got in the back seat when there was nobody in the front seat. The car was parked. <laughs> but I did get in the back seat. And it was a very cold day. And when you breathe out, you breathe out water within your breath and it formed a seal around the windows and it froze could i get out no i had to be rescued from the back window made the front page of the cron 
<laughs> I remember the story. I do. I remember it. I didn't know it was you. It was me. Now, I mentioned this story because um, we uh, have pet mechanics that look after us. Mm. And they will say, you need a new door seal. How much does Rolls-Royce chase charge for that? Now, this was centuries ago. Uh, well, for a door seal, it's about 150 quid. Now, mm. that was equivalent to about a £1,000 these days or something ridiculous. Yeah. He said, um, don't get one. Get a Rover one. It's exactly the same. There's no difference. It's in, it's in a different mm. box. How much do I pay for that? You pay practically nothing for it. Now, whether you've got a Rolls Royce, whether you can afford a Rolls Royce, what's well, second hand? It doesn't matter. You shouldn't be ripped off. Mm. No, exactly. You know, I, I have a pretend Bentley, like, you know, and um, the parts, and it's an American car. I love it. Uh, this year, bear in mind that I've been to nine, ten different countries in it. Uh, we've traveled thousands and thousands of miles and um, it's cost me about £1,500 in repairs uh, and servicing oh, because I'd change the oil every three or 4,000 miles. I uh, had the gearbox oil done this time. Good job because it was turned black and uh, there were signs that it was about to sell fire. Uh, and so we, we spend money on that car. Not a phenomenal amount, but parts are relatively expensive. And yet, not compared to the price of the real Bentley that it is a great pretender of. And the difference is, my faux Bentley cost, uh, uh, when it was new, I think it was £56,000. Um, the uh, equivalent in the true Bentley fashion uh, was £243,000. Now that's represented in the cost of uh, of, um, of part of parts, and uh, yeah, it is a ridiculous price. I remember one of my favourite cars uh, was a two-liter S Capri. I had that uh, in my heyday uh, of uh, being on the road as a news reporter, and it was fabulous, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. But that now. If I, well, replacing parts on that car all those years ago would now be far more expensive than it is to replace parts on my faux Bentley. Um, yeah, the whole thing is a rip-off. I got ripped off. I got ripped off in Slovakia. I'm not an idiot. I knew you'd rip me off, but there wasn't much I could do because I was a foreigner in a foreign land. And they charged me. 200 euros for engine oil. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I thought they'd... Yeah, well, they stuck it in by then. I wasn't going to say in a foreign language, take it out, put my old, my old oil back in. So, yes, the things you've just got to live with. Came over here, I think it was £110 for the oil, because it's special oil, because it's whatever it is, whatever the engine is. Hemi, Hemi, <laughs> Hemi. Okay, nothing about having a heavy engine, is there? Hemi. Yeah. Well, that leads, it leads us back to his shirt. I mean, now, for anybody to wear a Newcastle shirt is, is not easy. Uh, no, maybe it is now. Yeah, it suits him. And, uh, uh, yes. Well, it's the way it falls, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, now... Newcastle have been presented with billions, potentially, and I mean billions, by Saudi Arabia. And um, I wonder about all these football clubs and where the money's coming from. Good investment, good to fly your national flag, whether you come from uh, Manchester United and the Glaziers from America, whether you come from South Korea or whatever. Um, but it's contributed certain things. Uh, posh stadiums, uh, an extremely high rate to watch your team, even if you sat behind your own telly in your own living room. It's you don't get out for now, um, is the Mancunian phrase, and you don't. Uh, somebody's got to pay for it. Now, hypocrisy springs to mind big time. 
because there we have uh, Saudi Arabia coming in uh, to Newcastle and buying it out. And there we have the people bending the knee still in British football. You hypocrites. Inviting Saudi Arabia. And if you want to know anything about human rights, just study Saudi Arabia. They will dwarf what you're kneeling for the other side of the pond. It's hypocrisy, Lee. Well, did everybody who gets involved in it invite them over? I don't know. Do do because your bosses went, did a deal above your heads? Uh, do you then have to change your political point of view? I'd say no. Um, it's, uh, yeah, you want to keep on bending the knee. Uh, it wasn't your decision to do it and you want to object to it. Fine. Just remember, like, like good old Rodney says, uh, children are put to death in that place for, for for minor crimes or were i don't think they actually do that now uh but they were until very recently that women have only just been allowed to drive maybe that was a good law i don't know uh but um the uh the the general uh the general draconianism of that society is petrifying to people like us who come from a different part of the world and there's great many a great many dissenting voices in those places to make you wonder what's going on is it our job to to put them right I don't, i'm not sure whether it is maybe everybody's allowed to live their own lives um but yeah yeah to have the right to speak your own mind out is is something that you should be allowed to do no matter what the people uh, you uh, you work for have done just say it like there's a big uh, strike p pending in Hollywood uh, over the backs backroom boys and girls who um, who are earning minimum wage the equivalent of minimum wage in Britain and yet the moguls um, are still raking it in particularly through digital uh, programs through all sorts of different entertainment now remember louis b mayer in 1933 had exactly the same problem his, his way of solving uh, a financial crisis to say right you're all working for half uh, for half pay but that didn't go for olivia de Havilland and kirk douglas and people like that they carried on work working now that's hypocrisy that's hypocrisy and that hypocrisy are almost 90 years later still exists in that country terrible terrible hypocrisy is probably because hypocrisy is lying hypocrisy is not telling the truth it's hiding things and that really is one of the worst crimes that the human being can commit against another i believe hmm. yes indeed um right we'll move on um, and regrettably, we'll move on to um, Nigeria. Uh, things are bad, and it's not hit the press at all, or the press has decided in its win wisdom not to highlight this. But these are the facts. Uh, the Christians in Nigeria are under persecution. They are being killed in their droves. What's happened there, of course, the Muslims have got in power, and the in the wisdom again of the gov government there they've invited a lot of muslims be to become ministers in their equivalent of the cabinet um mm. and north middle and south uh are finding uh whole churches are being wiped out literally uh, mm. farmers are finding their lands taking them off taken off them uh shades of south africa there Mm. Uh, it's the richest country by far in Africa and the extreme Muslims, not the ordinary Muslims, I'm talking about people like Boko Haram, have got in there. And it staggers me that nobody appears to be doing anything about it. Certainly governments can do things that we can't do. Why are they not doing it? Is it possibly because of oil because it's a very oil rich country and other uh, basic needs of, of the world uh, are supplied by Nigeria. Uh, Lee, it's wicked. Somebody should stand up and say, stop this persecution. 
there's been a 60% rise in the last 18 months. Why are you killing the Christians? Christians are suffering more persecution than any other religion in the world, but especially mm. in Nigeria. We have been talking to Echi um, on a couple of occasions and broadcasting, uh, and he's um, the equivalent of a prince uh, mm. in Nigeria. He knows what goes on. Uh, he is fed up of the hypocrisy, but there seems to be no control over this. It is. It is a very bad situation in Nigeria. Uh, it is getting coverage in in the media. In fact, um, if you read uh, the Lee G Banks Preservation Society this week, uh, uh, or last week as it will be when this... No, this week. Uh, uh, we have, I think it's the third story down, um, a story about... Uh, racism in Nigeria and the effects that it has um, and the uh, it's a very heartbreaking in-depth uh, story of one man's experiences out in that country and yet yeah, the uh, the the state of the nation is absolutely appalling and fully enough uh, just uh, put the Muslims on the side for a minute one of the other major problems that they have out in Nigeria is the influx of Chinese and uh, particularly of Chinese builders who are creating grand, grand divides between uh, people and creating fantastic uh, racist barriers in that country. Yeah, uh, the, the, the problem with Nigeria is though that it's always been a rogue nation and um, as a rogue it lives by its own laws it pretends to adhere to certain things that suits that suits it at the time and uh, but as a rogue nation and one that's controlled in very very dubious circumstances it is a very bad place to be and uh, like i say the the story on uh, the Preservation Society makes that very clear now. And talking, like you say, to Eki, um, uh, he, he, uh, he, if you, what, if you read uh, the Gazette Standard, in there are all these abuses, all stories about all these abuses uh, that um, take place all the time over there. It's a shameful place and people do need to take some kind of strong interest in it. But who wants to? Who cares? That's well, the problem. Indeed, I mean, cares. The foreign offices in various countries should care about this. They can... Yeah, of course they should. Um, and whether it's isolating a nation by trade, something has got to be done. Uh, I yeah. must uh, mention that, again, that most media, uh, media, mainstream media does not cover it, but one paper did. And it's my favourite paper, The Guardian. Well done, The Guardian. You'd never yeah. thought I'd say that, would you? Well, The Guardian's funny, but it's a funny organ, if you forget. If we're not going back to the test we were talking about before. Uh, yeah, a, a very strange newspaper. I'm surprised that you say it. The BBC are covering it, of course. And sadly, that, that, that kind of news, uh, as horrific as it is, isn't seen as mainstream news it's just isn't it's, you know it's seen as page five news uh, there are there are strict strict borders within newspapers particularly we're talking about newspapers um and it's it's the page one page two which is very soft news and opinion page three which is the next stage of major news usually more uh, british news page four which is soft news page five which starts to become a bit harder and your international news which this would come under quite rightly because we aren't international newspapers we are national newspapers and uh, the international news usually is on page 10 and 11 9 10 and 11 and uh, that's the difference you've got to remember one thing we are not international press we are national press you mentioned page three then, that uh, you weren't referring to the sun. We'll move quickly on. And we will, uh, you did mention Sky News. I've yeah. not watched Sky News for about, I've got to admit, this is my 
Um, it, very remiss of me. Um, for about nearly six weeks, uh, for one reason or another, we've been inundated with various mm. things. I switched yeah. it on last night uh, about midnight. Wow. Now, we, we have had times when we've criticised Sky News, but I tell you what, talking about miserable things and making you miserable, if you want to be miserable, folks, watch Sky News. It was one devastating story after another. First one, we're all going to die because we're going to get flu, the normal type, at the same time as we get covid and everybody's going to die. Um, it's unscientific. Uh, there's a lot involved there, but that is their news. And it was quickly followed up. We're going to die anyway because the sun's going to, uh, when it goes down, going to be brighter and we're going to be fried alive. And the, the world's every single news item was bad news. Come on, Sky, lighten up. But of course, if you're a psychologist, you will dissect this and say well you know there are basic human traits one is flight if we get in danger we f fly away from the situation well yeah okay we need a certain amount of warning the other one of course is the big me that's you and i lee we think mm -hmm. of ourselves and if we see a bad news uh, story it might be the volcano in the canary islands oh i'm glad that's not me that's mm. the big me. So that's yeah. what appeals to people. They want yeah. the bad news, not the good. But as I say at the beginning, please lighten up, Sky. Uh, I tell you one reason they're doing it, but nobody will admit this. Uh, but the facts will eventually. GB News is pinching a lot of their, mm. and they said readers, viewers, an awful lot. So they're fighting back. Which other news programme in the world has half an hour green news on where the world is coming to an end every single day? Mm. And I did watch, actually, within that six-week period, one of these half-hour green programmes. And frankly, it was nonsense, it was non-scientific, and it was blues the whole way through. Mm. So um, there you go. Remember Pathé News? in the cinemas and they're selling all those clips mm. off at great yeah. prices at the moment but that gave you some good news as well as bad news perhaps we're more miserable now are we no it's different marketplaces this is what i'm saying to you you know um you've got to understand your marketplace i understand the marketplace for news implicitly i just know what the marketplace is uh the uh the basic national newspaper marketplace within Britain uh, is exactly what it says. It's national. Uh, it's not international. It's, um, it's It has its place for that. But it also gives you or tries to give you the background to um, immediate news. And that immediacy of the news and that background to it is what the marketplace is about. Now, plenty of people from Eddie Shah further back to... Uh, different uh, people all the way through even in recent years have tried to give you uh, good news and papers and every single one has failed that's not because of the media dear that's not because it's because the public who, who buy uh, newspapers the marketplace for a good news organization doesn't exist find one that does and it's not because of the media dear it's because of the people who want to buy it. Nobody wants interested in good news. No, we're all now, miserable beggars. Yeah, that's it. But it's it is a marketplace now. Pathé News was designed specifically for cinema. Finally, uh, we got to go. Uh, some good <laughs> news. Some good news. And I've been digging into this just for you. Uh, and that is that there is a company now in Britain that will convert your DBS. Aston Martin and oh, other my. posh cars, even a faux Bentley, they yeah. convert into an electric milk float. They will <sighs> make you an electric engine. <sighs> my God, it will cost you. But is the future, is it? I'd rather have a talk talk. Yes. To be honest. 
Yeah, if, when we when we finally settle down, I'm going to keep my big faux Bentley, and I'm going to buy myself a tuk tuk, and we'll go anywhere all over the place in my tuk tuk. I like tuk tuks. I once had an elephant in a tuk tuk with me. Um, Don't be that. Never forgive me. <laughs> We've got to go. I'm in trouble again. And um, we will go on a last thought for the day. And I will quote you some figures about our green friends that I love so much. Uh, and our green friends, um, let me give you some facts and figures, just two. Um, of these people that are trying to tell us which way to go and we're all doomed and we should save money and become poor. 86% of the people that stick themselves to the M25 road, 86% have got good university degrees. Yeah. What? And the rest are vicars. Draw your own <laughs> conclusion. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. The middle class oiks who think it's good to go and sit on a road and glue themselves to it. Yeah, get back to your nicely, whatever it is, environmental houses and your cushy little jobs and your little electric cars. Yeah, we have, I don't, I don't understand them. Yeah, this isn't hippydom, this is middle classydom. Well, I agree, I agree with most of what you said, except. Uh... They've got no jobs to go back to, mate. They're on the dole. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's how the middle classes make the money now, isn't it? Indeed. Right, we, we, we're off ski. And um, we'll see you in Spain via France. Yeah. He's going to go yeah. to France and he's going to do a bit yeah. of a travel log. Uh, so yeah. you've got that to look forward to, viewer. Yeah, yeah. I might even buy a, buy a, a, a film thing. Don't, you know, one of those film camera things that you all like that. Yeah, a brownie box. I'll drive along yeah. what you yeah. can cope with. I'll do a selfie. I'll do a selfie like that as I'm driving. Yeah. <laughs> Hooks the viewer off completely. See you next <laughs> week, Lee. All right, no problem.